The Cloak by Nikolai Vasilievich Gogol Translation from the Russian by Isabel F. Hapgood Read by Alan Davis Drake This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to learn how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Part 2 of Two Parts Where the host lived, unfortunately, we cannot say. Our memory begins to fail us badly. And everything in St. Petersburg, all the houses and streets, have run together and become so mixed up in our head that it is very difficult to produce anything thence in proper form. At all events, this much is certain, that the Chinovniks lived in the best part of town, and therefore it must have been anything but near to Akake Akakeyevich. Akake Akakeyevich was first obliged to transverse a sort of wilderness of deserted, dimly lighted streets. But in proportion as he approached the Chinovniks' quarter of the city, the streets became more lively, more populous, and more brilliantly illuminated. Pedestrians began to appear. Handsomely dressed ladies were more frequently encountered. The men had otter collars. Peasant wagoners, with their grate-like sledges struck full of gilt nails, became rarer. On the other hand, more and more coachmen in red velvet caps with lacquered sleighs and bearskin robes began to appear. Carriages with decorated coach-boxes flew swiftly through the streets, their wheels scrunching the snow. Akake Akakeyevich gazed upon all this as upon a novelty. He had not been in the streets during the evening for years. He halted out of curiosity before the lighted window of a shop, to look at a picture representing a handsome woman who had thrown off her shoe, thereby bearing her whole foot in a very pretty way, and behind her the head of a man with side-whiskers and a handsome moustache peeped from the door of another room. Akake Akakeyevich shook his head and laughed and then went on his way. Why did he laugh? Because he had met with a thing utterly unknown, but for which everyone cherished, nevertheless, some sort of feeling. Or else he thought, like many officials, as follows. Well, those French, what is to be said? If they like anything of that sort, then, in fact, that... But possibly he did not think that for it is impossible to enter a man's mind and know all that he thinks. At length he reached the house in which the assistant chief lodged. The assistant chief lived in fine style. On the staircase burned a lantern. His apartment was on the second floor. On entering the vestibule, Akake Akakeyevich beheld a whole row of overshoes on the floor. Amid them, in the center of the room, stood a samovar, humming and emitting clouds of steam. On the wall hung all sorts of coats and cloaks, among which there were even some with beaver collars or velvet facings. Beyond the wall the buzz of conversation was audible, which became clear and loud when the servant came out with a tray full of empty glasses, cream jars, and sugar bowls. It was evident that the Chinovniks had arrived long before, and had already finished their first glass of tea. Akaki Akakeyevich, having hung up his own cloak, entered the room, and before him all at once appeared lights, officials, pipes, card tables, and he was surprised by a sound of rapid conversation rising from all the tables, and the noise of moving chairs. He halted very awkwardly in the middle of the room, wondering and trying to decide what he ought to do. But they had seen him. They received him with a shout, and all went out at once into the anteroom and took another look at his cloak. Akake Akakeyevich, although somewhat confused, was open-hearted, and could not refrain from rejoicing when he saw how they praised his cloak. Then, of course, they all dropped him and his cloak and returned, as was proper, to the table set out for whist. All this 
was rather wonderful to Akakey Akakeyevich. He simply did not know where he stood, or where to put his hands, his feet, and his whole body. Finally he sat down by the players, looked at the cards, gazed at the face of one and another, and after a while began to gape, and to feel that it was wearisome, the more so as the hour was already long past when he usually went to bed. He wanted to take leave of the host, but they would not let him go, saying that he must drink a glass of champagne in honor of his new garment without fail. In the course of an hour supper was served, consisting of vegetable salad, cold veal, pastry, confectioner's pies, and champagne. They made Akake Akakevich drink two glasses of champagne, after which he felt that the room grew livelier. Still, he could not forget that it was twelve o'clock, and that he should have been at home long ago. In order that the host might not think of some excuse for detaining him, he went out of the room quietly, sought out in the ante-room his cloak, which, to his sorrow, he found lying on the floor, brushed it, picked off every speck, put it on his shoulders, and descended the stairs to the street. In the street all was still bright. Some petty shops, those permanent clubs of servants and all sorts of people, were open. Others were shut, but nevertheless showed a streak of light the whole length of the door-crack, indicating that they were not yet free of company, and that probably domesticates, both men and women, were finishing their stories and conversations, leaving their masters in complete ignorance as to their whereabouts. Akakey Akakeyevich went on in a happy frame of mind. He even started to run, without knowing why, after some lady, who flew past like a flash of lightning, and whose whole body was endowed with an extraordinary amount of movement. But he stopped short, and went on very quietly as before, wondering whence he had got that gait. Soon there spread before him those deserted streets, which are not cheerful in the daytime, not to mention the evening. Now they were even more dim and lonely. The lanterns began to grow rarer. Oil evidently had been less liberally supplied. Then came wooden houses and fences. Not a soul anywhere. Only the snow sparkling in the streets, and the mournfully darkled, the low-roofed cabins with their closed shutters. He approached the place where the street crossed an endless square with barely visible houses on its farther side, and which seemed a fearful desert. Afar, God knows where, a tiny spark glimmered from some sentry-box, which seemed to stand on the edge of the world. Akakey Akakeyevich's cheerfulness diminished at this point in a marked degree. He entered the square, not without an involuntary sensation of fear, as though his heart warned him of some evil. He glanced back and on both sides. It was like a sea about him. No, it is better not to look, he thought, and went on, closing his eyes. And when he opened them, to see whether he was near the end of the square, he suddenly beheld, standing just before his nose, some bearded individuals, of just what sort he could not make out. All grew dark before his eyes, and his breast throbbed. "'But of course the cloak is mine,' said one of them in a loud voice, seizing hold of the collar. Akaki Akakeyevich was about to shout, "'Watch!' when the second man thrust a fist into his mouth, about the size of a chinovnik's head, muttering, "'Now scream!' Akake Akakeyevich felt them take off his cloak and give him a push with a knee. He fell headlong upon the snow, and felt no more. In a few minutes he recovered consciousness and rose to his feet, but no one was there. He felt that it was cold in the square, and that his cloak was gone. He began to shout, but his voice did not appear to reach to the outskirts of the square. In despair, but without ceasing to shout, he started on a run through the square straight towards the sentry-box beside which stood the watchman, leaning on his halberd, 
and apparently curious to know what devil of a man was running towards him from afar and shouting. Akaki Akakeyevich ran up to him, and began in a sobbing voice to shout that he was asleep, and attended to nothing, and did not see when a man was robbed. The watchman replied that he had seen no one, that he had seen two men stop him in the middle of the square, and supposed that they were friends of his, and that instead of scolding in vain, he had better go to the captain on the morrow, so that the captain might investigate as to who had stolen the coat. Akaki Akakevich ran home in complete disorder. His hair, which grew very thinly upon his temples and the back of his head, was entirely disarrayed. His side and breast and all his trousers were covered with snow. The old woman, the mistress of his lodgings, hearing a terrible knocking, sprang hastily from her bed, and with a shoe on one foot only, ran to open the door, pressing the sleeves of her chemise to her bosom out of modesty. But when she had opened it, she fell back on beholding Akake Akakeyevich in such a state. When he told the matter, she clasped her hands, and said he must go straight to the superintendent, for the captain would turn up his nose, promise well, and drop the matter there. The very best thing to do would be to go to the superintendent, that he had known her, because Finnish Anna, her former cook, was now nurse at the superintendent's, that she often saw him passing the house, and that he was at church every Sunday praying, but at the same time gazing cheerfully at everybody, and that he must be a good man, judging from all appearances. Having listened to this opinion, Akakey Akakeyevich betook himself sadly to his chamber, and how he spent the night there, any one can imagine who can put himself in another's place. Early in the morning he presented himself at the superintendent's, but they told him he was asleep. He went again at ten, and was again informed that he was asleep. He went at eleven o'clock, and they said, the superintendent is not at home at dinner time, and the clerks in the anteroom would not admit him on any terms, and insisted upon knowing his business, and what brought him here, and how it had come about. So that at last, for once in his life, Akake Akakeyevich felt an inclination to show some spirit, and said curtly that he must see the superintendent in person that they should not presume to refuse him entrance, that he came from the Department of Justice, and when he complained to them, they would see. The clerks dared not make a reply to this, and one of them went to call the superintendent. The superintendent listened to the extremely strange story of the theft of the coat. Instead of directing his attention to the principal points of the matter, he began to question Akake Akakeyevich. Why did he return so late? Was he in the habit of going, or had he been to any disorderly house? So that Akaki Akakeyevich got thoroughly confused, and left him without knowing whether the affair of his cloak was in proper train or not. All that day he never went near the court, for the first time in his life. The next day he made his appearance, very pale, and in his old mantle, which had become even more shabby. The news of the robbery of the cloak touched many, although there were officials present who never omitted an opportunity, even the present, to ridicule Akake Akakeyevich. They decided to take up a collection for him on the spot, but it turned out a mere trifle, for the Chikovniks had already spent a great deal in subscribing to the director's portrait, and for some book, at the suggestion of the head of that division, who was a friend of the author. And so the sum was trifling. One, moved by pity, resolved to help Akake Akakeyevich with some good advice at least, and told him that he ought not to go to the captain, for although it might happen that the police captain, wishing to win the approval of his superior officers, might hunt up the cloak by some means, still the cloak would remain in the possession of the police if he did not offer legal proof that it belonged to him. The best thing for him would be to apply to a certain prominent personage, that this prominent personage 
by entering into relationship with the proper persons, could greatly expedite the matter. As there was nothing else to be done, Akakey Akakeyevich decided to go to the prominent personage. What was the official position of the prominent personage remains unknown to this day. The reader must know that the prominent personage had but recently become a prominent personage, but up to that time he had been an insignificant person. Moreover, his present position was not considered prominent in comparison with others more prominent. But there is always a circle of people to whom what is insignificant in the eyes of others is always important enough. Moreover, he strove to increase his importance by many devices. Namely, he managed to have the inferior officials meet him on the staircase when he entered upon his service. No one was to presume to come directly to him, but the strictest etiquette must be observed. The collegiate recorder must announce to the government secretary, the government secretary to the titular councillor, or whatever other man was proper, and the business came before him in this manner. In holy Russia, all is thus contaminated with the love of imitation. Each man imitates and copies his superior. They even say that a certain titular counselor, when promoted to the head of some little separate courtroom, immediately partitioned off a private room for himself, called it the audience chamber, and posted at the door a lackey with red collar and braid, who grasped the handle of the door and opened to all comers though the audience chamber would hardly hold an ordinary writing table. The manners and customs of the prominent personage were grand and imposing, but rather exaggerated. Strictness, strictness, and always strictness, he generally said, and at the last word he looked significantly into the face of the person to whom he spoke, but there was no necessity for this for the half-score of Chikovniks who formed the entire force of the mechanism of the office were properly afraid without it. On catching sight of him afar off, they left their work and waited, drawn up in line, until their chief had passed through the room. His ordinary converse with his inferiors smacked of sternness, and consisted chiefly of three phrases. How dare you? Do you know to whom you are talking? Do you realize who stands before you? Otherwise he was a very kind-hearted man, good to his comrades and ready to oblige. But the rank of general threw him completely off his balance. On receiving that rank he became confused, as it were, lost his way, and never knew what to do. If he chanced to be with his equals, he was still a very nice kind of man, a very good fellow in many respects, and not stupid but just the moment he happened to be in the society of people but one rank lower than himself, he was simply incomprehensible. He became silent, and his situation aroused sympathy, the more so, as he felt himself that he might have made an incomparably better use of the time. In his eyes there was something visible, a desire to join some interesting conversation and circle, but he was held back by the thought would it not be a very great condensation on his part? Would it not be familiar? And would he not thereby lose his importance? And, in consequence of such reflections, he remained ever in the same dumb state, uttering only occasionally a few monosyllabic sounds, and thereby earning the name of the most tiresome of men. To this prominent personage our Akakey Akakeyevich presented himself, and that at the most unfavorable time, very unopportune for himself, though opportune for the prominent personage. The prominent personage was in his cabinet, conversing very, very gaily with a recently arrived old acquaintance and companion of his childhood, whom he had not seen for several years. At such a time it was announced to him that a person named Basmachkin had come. He asked abruptly, who is he? Some chinovnik, they told him. Ah, he can wait. This is no time, said the important man. It must be remarked here that the important man lied outrageously. He had said all he had said to his friend long before, 
and the conversation had been interspersed for some time with very long pauses, during which they merely slapped each other on the leg and said, "'You think so, Ibram Ivanovich?' "'Just so, Stepan Varlamovich.' Nevertheless, he ordered that the Chikovnik should wait, in order to show his friend, a man who had not been in the service for a long time, but had lived at home in the country, how long Chikovniks had to wait in his ante-room. At length, having talked himself completely out, and more than that, having had his fill of pauses, and smoked a cigar in a very comfortable armchair with reclining back, he suddenly seemed to recollect, and told the secretary, who stood by the door with papers of reports, Yes, it seems, indeed, that there is a Chakovnik standing there. Tell him that he may come in. On perceiving Akaki Akakeyevich's modest mien, and his worn undress uniform, he turned abruptly to him and said, What do you want? in a curt hard voice, which he had practiced in his room in private and before the looking-glass for a whole week before receiving his present rank. Akake Akakeyevich, who had already felt betimes the proper amount of fear, became somewhat confused, and as well as he could, as well as his tongue would permit, he explained, with a rather more frequent addition than usual of the word that, that his cloak was quite new and had been stolen in the most inhumane manner, that he had applied to him in order that he might in some way, by his intermediation, that he might enter into correspondence with the chief superintendent of police and find the cloak. For some inexplicable reason, this conduct seemed familiar to the general. What, my dear sir, he said abruptly, don't you know etiquette? Where have you come from? Do you know how matters are managed? You should first have entered a complaint about this at the court. It would have gone to the head of the department, to the chief of the division. Then it would have been handed over to the secretary, and the secretary would have given it to me. But, Your Excellency, said Akaki Akakeyevich, trying to collect his small handful of wits, and conscious at the same time that he was perspiring terribly. I, Your Excellency, presumed to trouble you because secretaries that are an untrustworthy race. What? 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 said the important personage. Where did you get such courage? Where did you get such ideas? What impudence towards their chiefs and superiors has spread among the young generation? The prominent personage apparently had not observed that Akake Akakeyevich was already in the neighborhood of fifty. If he could be called a young man, then it must have been in comparison with someone who was seventy. Do you know to whom you speak? Do you realize who stands before you? Do you realize it? Do you realize it, I ask you? Then he stamped his foot and raised his voice in such a pitch that it would have frightened even a different man from Akaki Akakeyevich. Akaki Akakeyevich's senses failed him. He staggered, trembled in every limb, and could not stand. If the porters had not run in to support him, he would have fallen to the floor. They carried him out insensible, but the prominent personage, gratified that the effect should have surpassed his expectations, and quite intoxicated with the thought that his word could even deprive a man of his senses, glanced sideways at his friend, in order to see how he looked upon this, and perceived, not without satisfaction, that his friend was in a most undecided frame of mind and even beginning, on his side, to feel a trifle frightened. Akake Akakeyevich could not remember how he descended the stairs and stepped into the street. He felt neither his hands nor feet. Never in his life had he been so raided by any general, let alone a strange one. He went on through the snowstorm, which was howling through the streets, with his mouth wide open, slipping off the sidewalk, the wind, in Petersburg fashion, flew upon him from all quarters, and through every cross-street. In a twinkle it had blown a quinsy into his throat, and he reached home 
unable to utter a word. His throat was all swollen, and he lay down on his bed. So powerful is sometimes a good scolding. The next day a violent fever made its appearance. Thanks to the generous assistance of the Petersburg climate, his malady progressed more rapidly than could have been expected, and when the doctor arrived he found on feeling his pulse that there was nothing to be done, except to prescribe a fomentation, merely that the sick man might not be left without the beneficent aid of medicine. But at the same time he predicted his end in another thirty-six hours. After this he turned to the landlady and said, And as for you, my dear, don't waste your time on him. Order his pine coffin now, for an oak one will be too expensive for him. Did Akakey Akakeyevich hear these fatal words? And, if he heard them, did they produce any overwhelming effect upon him? Did he lament the bitterness of his life? We know not, for he continued in a raving, parching condition. Visions incessantly appeared to him, each stranger than the other. Now he saw Petrovich and ordered him to make a cloak with some traps for robbers, who seemed to him to be always under the bed, and he cried every moment to the landlady to pull one robber from under his coverlet. Then he inquired why his old mantle hung before him when he had a new cloak. Then he fancied that he was standing before the general, listening to a thorough settle-down and saying, Forgive, Your Excellency. But at last he began to curse uttering the most horrible words, so that his aged landlady crossed herself, never in her life having heard anything of the kind from him, the more so as those words followed directly after the words, Your Excellency. Later he talked utter nonsense, of which nothing could be understood. All that was evident was that his incoherent words and thoughts hovered ever about one thing his cloak. At last, poor Akakey Akakeyevich breathed his last. They sealed up neither his room nor his effects, because, in the first place, there were no heirs, and in the second there was very little inheritance, namely a bunch of goose quills, a choir of white official paper, three pairs of socks, two or three buttons which had burst off his trousers, and the mantle already known to the reader. To whom all this fell, God knows. I confess that the person who told this tale took no interest in the matter. They carried Akakey Akakeyevich out and buried him. And Petersburg was left without Akakey Akakeyevich, as though he had never lived there. A being disappeared and was hidden, who was protected by none, dear to none, interesting to none, and who never even attracted himself to the attention of an observer of nature, who omits no opportunity of thrusting a pin through a common fly and examining it under the microscope, a being who bore meekly the jibes of the department and went to his grave without having done one unusual deed, but to whom, nevertheless, at the close of his life, appeared a bright visitant in the form of a cloak which momentarily cheered his poor life, and upon whom, thereafter, an intolerable misfortune descended, just as it descends upon the heads of the mighty of the world. Several days after his death, the porter was sent from the department to his lodgings, with an order for him to present himself immediately. The chief commands it. But the porter had to return unsuccessful, with the answer that he would not come, and to the question, why, he explained in the words, well, because he's already dead. He was buried four days ago. In this manner did they hear of Akakey Akakeyevich's death at the department, and the next day a new and much larger Chikovnik sat in his place, forming his letters by no means upright, but more inclined and slantwise. But who could have imagined that this was not the end of Akakey Akakeyevich, 
that he was destined to raise a commotion after death, as if in compensation for his utterly insignificant life. But so it happened, and our poor story unexpectedly gains a fantastic ending. A rumor suddenly spread through Petersburg that a dead man had taken to appearing on the Kalinkin Bridge and far beyond, at night, in the form of a Jakovnik seeking a stolen cloak. Under the pretext of its being a stolen cloak, he dragged everyone's cloak from his shoulders without regard to rank or calling. Catskin, beaver, wadded, fox, bear, raccoon coats. In a word, every sort of fur or skin which men adopted for their covering. One of the department employees saw the dead man with his own eyes and immediately recognized him as Akaki Akakeyevich. Nevertheless, this inspired him with such terror that he started to run with all his might and therefore could not examine thoroughly and only saw how the latter threatened him from afar with his finger. Constant complaints poured in from all quarters that the backs and shoulders, not only of titular but even of court councillors, were entirely exposed to the danger of a cold, on account of the frequent dragging off of their cloaks. Arrangements were made by the police to catch the corpse at any cost, alive or dead, and punish him as an example to others, in the most severe manner, and in this they nearly succeeded. For a policeman, on guard in Kirushkin Alley, caught the corpse by the collar on the very scene of his evil deeds, for attempting to pull off the frieze coat of some retired musician who had blown the flute in his day. Having seized him by the collar, he summoned, with a shout, two of his comrades, whom he enjoined to hold him fast, while he himself felt for a moment in his boot, in order to draw thence his snuff-box to refresh his six times forever frozen nose. But the snuff was of a sort which even a corpse could not endure. The policeman had no sooner succeeded, having closed his right nostril with his finger, in holding half a handful up to the left, that the corpse sneezed so violently that he completely filled the eyes of all three. While they raised their fists to wipe them, the dead man vanished utterly so that they positively did not know whether they had actually had him in their hands at all. Thereafter, the watchmen conceived such a terror of dead men that they were afraid even to seize the living, and only screamed from a distance, Hey there, go your way! And the dead Chikovnik began to appear even beyond the Kalinkin Bridge, causing no little terror to all timid people but we have totally neglected that certain prominent personage, who may really be considered as the cause of the fantastic turn taken by this true history. First of all, justice compels us to say that after the departure of poor, thoroughly annihilated Akaki Akakeyevich, he felt something like remorse. Suffering was unpleasant to him, his heart was accessible to many good impulses, in spite of the fact that his rank very often prevented his showing his true self. As soon as his friend had left his cabinet, he began to think about poor Akake Akakeyevich, and from that day forth, poor Akake Akakeyevich, who could not bear up under an official reprimand, recurred to his mind almost every day. The thought of the latter troubled him to such an extent that a week later he even resolved to send an official to him, to learn whether he really could assist him. And when it was reported to him that Akake Akakeyevich had died suddenly of fever, he was startled, listened to the reproaches of his conscience, and was out of sorts for the whole day. Wishing to divert his mind in some way, and forget the disagreeable impression, he set out that evening for one of his friend's houses where he found quite a large party assembled. And, what was better, nearly every one was of the same rank, so that he need not feel in the least constrained. This had a marvelous effect upon his mental state. He expanded, made himself agreeable in conversation, charming. In sort, he passed a delightful evening. After supper he drank a couple of glasses of champagne, 
not a bad recipe for cheerfulness, as everyone knows. The champagne inclined him to various out-of-the-way adventures, and in particular he determined not to go home, but to go to see a certain well-known lady, Karolina Ivanovna, a lady, it appears, of German extraction, with whom he felt on a very friendly footing. It must be mentioned that the prominent personage was no longer a young man, but a good husband and respected father of a family. Two sons, one of them was already in the service, and a good-looking sixteen-year-old daughter, with a rather retroussé but pretty little nose, came every morning to kiss his hand and say, Bonjour, papa. His wife, a still fresh and good-looking woman, first gave him her hand to kiss, and then, reversing the procedure, kissed his. But the prominent personage, though perfectly satisfied in his domestic relations, considered it stylish to have a friend in another quarter of the city. This friend was hardly prettier or younger than his wife, but there are such puzzles in the world, and it is not our place to judge them. So the important personage descended the stairs, stepped into his sleigh, and said to the coachman, To Karolina Ivanovna's, and wrapped himself luxuriously in his warm cloak, found himself in that delightful position than which a Russian can conceive nothing better. Yet the thoughts crept into your mind of their own accord, each more agreeable than the other, giving you no trouble to drive them away or seek them. Fully satisfied, he slightly recalled all the gay points of the evening just past, and all the mots which had made the small circle laugh. Many of them he repeated in a low voice, and found them quite as funny as before, and therefore it is not surprising that he should laugh heartily at them. Occasionally, however, he was hindered by gusts of wind, which, coming suddenly, God knows whence or why, cut his face flinging it in lumps of snow, filling out his cloak-collar like a sail, or suddenly blowing it over his head with supernatural force, and thus causing him constant trouble to disentangle himself. Suddenly the important personage felt someone clutch him very firmly by the collar. Turning round, he perceived a man of short stature, in an old worn uniform, and recognized, not without terror, Akaki Akakeyevich. The Chikovnik's face was white as snow and looked just like a corpse's, but the horror of the important personage transcended all bounds when he saw the dead man's mouth open and with a terrible odor of the grave utter the following remarks. Ah, here you are at last. I have you, that, by the collar. I need your cloak. You took no trouble about mine, but reprimanded me. Now give me your own. The pallid, prominent personage almost died. Brave as he was in the office and in the presence of inferiors generally, and although at the sight of his manly form and appearance everyone said, Ugh, how much character he has! Yet at this crisis, he, like many possessed of a heroic exterior, experienced such terror that, not without cause, he began to fear an attack of illness. He flung his cloak hastily from his shoulders and shouted to his coachman in an unnatural voice, Ho! At full speed! The coachman, hearing the tone which is generally employed at critical moments, and even accompanied by something much more tangible, drew his head down between his shoulders in case of an emergency, flourished his knout, and flew on like an arrow. In a little more than six minutes the prominent personage was at the entrance of his own house. Pale, thoroughly scarred and cloakless, he went home instead of to Karolina Ivanovna's, got to his chamber after some fashion, passed the night in the direst distress so that the next morning, over their tea, his daughter said plainly, You are very pale today, Papa. But Papa remained silent, and said not a word to any one of what had happened to him, where he had been, or where he had intended to go. This occurrence made a deep impression upon him. He even began to say less frequently to the under-officials, How dare you! 
Do you realize who stands before you? And if he did utter the words, it was after first having heard the bearings of the matter. But the most noteworthy point was that from that day the apparition of the dead Chikovnik quite ceased to be seen. Evidently the general's cloak just fitted his shoulders. At any events, no more instances of his dragging cloaks from people's shoulders were heard of. But many active and apprehensive persons could by no means reassure themselves, and asserted that the dead Chikovnik still showed himself in distant parts of the city, and in fact one watchman in Kolomna saw with his own eyes the apparition come from behind a house, but being rather weak of body. So much so, that once upon a time an ordinary full-grown pig, running out of a private house, knocked him off his legs, to the great amusement of the surrounding Izvashtchiks, for whom he demanded a groschen apiece for snuff as damages. Being weak, he dared not arrest him, but followed him in the dark, until at length the apparition looked round, paused, and inquired, "'What do you want?' and showed such a fist as you've never seen on living men. The watchman said, It's of no consequence, and turned back instantly. But the apparition was much too tall, wore huge mustaches, and directing its steps apparently towards the Obukov Bridge, disappeared in the darkness of the night. End of The Cloak by Nikolai Gogol Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake